Third construction was one of the first pieces uh, so learned back in the day. Um, when we were in school, we, we went through a year of learning lots of different repertoire, and, and uh, by the time it was ready for us to, to go out and play concerts, we decided this was a, a piece we needed to play. And for a few years, we stopped touring with it, looking into some, some new repertoire. Uh, we've kind of revisited John Cage in, in a big way. And I think one reason, at least, at least for me, um, is it, it's just so hard uh, to ignore his presence in, in the percussion world and in what we do. Um, and also just the, the experimental music scene world, uh, contemporary music, classical music. Um, he's such a, a huge presence. You know, so often we'll be working on something, uh, a piece that one of us has brought to the table to work on, a piece that another composer has brought to the table. And you get the feeling, it's like, oh, I've discovered this thing that's new. And then you realize that Cage kind of already did it. Um, I've been thinking about him a lot, I guess, because um, trying to figure out how so fits into this music scene in New York City. Um, we've been, you know, trying to go out and listen to a lot of different music, um, see a lot of different art and dance um, that's happening in the city, and realizing that John Cage was a part of that uh, 50 years ago really kind of tapped into um, the art that was happening in his community. Um, it just so happens that the art that was happening in his community um, was being made by remarkable um, artists and dancers, um, painters, sculptors, uh, musicians. Um, but that's the same thing now in any city you're in. There's a community to be a part of. Um, when Cage was doing some, some really experimental things, um, you know, he's, he's very famous for uh, his, his silent piece, what he called a silent piece, uh, four minutes and 33 seconds. At the same time in the art world, there were painters like Robert Rauschenberg making canvases that were all black and kind of making a statement, really questioning what is painting at the same time that John Cage was questioning really what is music. Um, when Cage started to take sounds from everywhere, he wrote a lot of really neat pieces uh, for radios and um, record players and a lot of different kind of collage sounds or even a lot of these sounds that, that we played in Third Construction today. Uh, all the tin cans and rattles and this kind of like, you know, collage work. These visual artists at the time were doing the same thing. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg was, was picking up on, on a kind of a strand that had already been there, um, but taking all these found objects, finding, um, you know, two doors on the street, putting them next to each other, finding a newspaper article that he loved, or, or just probably that he found in the trash, and putting that next to it, and making a collage um, with paint, with uh, glue with tape with anything he could find and making something beautiful out of it. Um, there was kind of a really kind of parallel strand with uh, visual artists at the time and uh, musicians and with dancers. Uh, John Cage was so important um, as a composer in, in, in the dance world, most notably working with Merce Cunningham, um, making music for his dancers, making music with um, with Merce Cunningham, uh, both Merce as a, as a performer, but also just, just working together in a really collaborative way. And to see how that scene was so, um, just so fruitful and so wonderful uh, for us to think about, you know, kind of everything that was around this music at the time, and then to think about our own community and kind of how we can fit into that. Um, I guess it's been, it's been very timely for us. Um, and I, I guess I would use it as a chance to urge Everybody um, in any community that you're in, whether it's uh, you know in school or in um, you know just just the music that you're playing, to really tap into what else is happening. Uh, we've talked about some of the influences, string quartets, and uh, different bands that have been an influence on how we play chamber music. Um, I would say to look outside of, of just music and look at the art world and the dance world. Um, John Cage was very much a part of that kind of whole whole thing, and, and we've been talking about that a lot lately, seeing how we can fit into that. Yeah, I, I had a huge, like, last summer I was doing, I just said I was going to read some books, uh, and I had a whole list of books I was going to read, and, and one in particular, two in particular, one was both of which by, or about John Cage, one called Silence, which was a collection of his works, uh, writings, and another called For the Birds that was uh, a published interview by a guy, I believe his name is Daniel Charles, uh, that was, was an interview that he did with Cage over the course of like a month or something. And there's a, 
I remember having this this like moment of like holy smokes everything I thought I knew about John Cage um, not that it was turned on its head but it, it it made me go back and reassess a lot of stuff and I, and I think growing up as a percussionist you play third construction or you play you hear about four minutes and 33 seconds you knew you hear about the prepared piano and there's this sort of uh, almost weirdly a dogmatic sort of uh, rigidness to people's view on him like he's the guy who he's the guy who's known for you can do whatever you want and when you play his pieces you can do anything you want because that's what he's about it's a little like us saying like I know where we come from as human beings like it's <laughs> such a complex thing to 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 answer and to just put with a with a you know to paint with a wide brush and say that John Cage is the guy you can do anything because he wrote four minutes and thirty three seconds uh, and these these books he talks a lot about um, the reasons what about how or how he comes about writing his music and his his reliance on the I Ching. Uh, as a way to randomly come up with structures to his pieces, um, or to roll dice to determine structures, or to take a, a you know a blank piece of paper and put a transparency over it and use the, the 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 stuff that's messed up in the paper as a way to get notation, and then you just trace those out, and then you take the transparency, and that's the that's the music that you read. It's a really it, it made me go back and realize that Cage is is a lot more complex than we think. And I remember as you know coming up through my undergrad, seeing a, another group play Third Construction and, not, and looking at the score and saying twelve chom, you know Chinese tom toms with tacks, and then seeing them use drum set tom toms and being really angry and upset about it because there's there's no way John Cage would do that. That's not right. But then realizing we were very lucky enough to to have dinner with uh, Merce Cunningham in his loft and. He was telling these stories about him and John Cage and uh, David Tudor and Tini Duchamp and Marcel Duchamp in a van, like a Volkswagen bus or something, just like driving up the New Jersey Turnpike on their way back from gigs. And hearing them just like, we're going to pull over to the side of the road and make dinner with whatever we find in the gardens or in, in the woods there. In that sort of way of lifestyle, you realize that the, that the way, why he wrote these pieces, and I'm by no means a Cage scholar, but just that... That sort of mentality of approaching life, I think Cage approached his music in that same way. Now, now when you look at a score like Third Construction and, and you look at the rhythms, it's a highly constructed piece of music. It's based on the square root formula, 24 by 24, right? And you, you can dissect that down to the tiniest little faction of that and, and realize that, wow, there's some pretty complex math going on. But when you step back and look at the whole picture, it's a really organic thing. And... The second thing, aside from these readings, that made me sort of step back and reassess what I thought about Cage was a YouTube clip of him playing a piece called Water Walk, W-A-T-E-R-W-A-L-K, I think it's one word. And if you just Google search or you know, YouTube search it and, and watch it, it's him on a game show in 1951 called I Have a Secret. And he plays a piece called, of his called Water Walk, and, and there's this very weird, like, you should just watch it. You should watch it from start to finish and and see how he deals with the problems that were given to him. I think we've talked a lot about today of like when we're on tour and we have this thing and it calls for a log drum, but we get to the hall and there's no log drum, so what do we use? We use wood slats. <clears throat> Our approach and how we deal with those things, I think we felt a lot better about going that route and feeling okay with exploring many different options after seeing this YouTube clip of him, of, of, of the very composer himself playing his own piece of music under really weird circumstances and seeing how, you know, how he deals with it. So I would highly suggest you check it out. Waterwalk, John Cage on YouTube. I think it'll really open your eyes in a really cool way. Um, one of the, playing Third Construction, I mean, when you hear it, it's a really, really complex piece of rhythms. It's like, you know, kind of jamming up in your face type of piece. But he also has a lot of music that's ambient. Very, very soft, very mellow, lot, not highly structured. There's a piece of his called Child of Tree and Branches that uh, there's a really, there's a time structure that you follow that you, you generate yourself by the I, Ching method, the I Ching method. And then you just improvise with plant materials that you find like a cactus or a pod rattle or a leaf or a branch or something. Uh, and then there's another really beautiful piece of his called Inlets that is for any length of time that you want. You just decide up front how long it's going to be. And... Everybody is given a conch shell. This is just a, like a you know conch shell from the ocean, but it's really huge. And these this, these are actually his personal conch shells that the the uh, Merce Cunningham Dance Company actually has these 
uh, stored in their basement. They've, they've been really, really good to us and super supportive and, and have loaned these out to us on several occasions to play this, play this beautiful piece. Um, everybody has four different sizes of these that you sort of work through over the course of the piece and the, and the piece kind of, you start playing one shelf for a short amount of time and then you play the second shelf for a little longer, the third for a little longer, and the fourth for a little longer. And in the middle, there's a tape that Cage recorded uh, in a field. He just set up this pile of pine cones and set them on fire and recorded what that sounded like. And that's placed in the middle, and then the piece ends with one player blowing the conch. And, and what you do with these conches is you put water in them. And if you can hear, when you get up close, if you gurgle them back and forth or turn them in like that. The smaller ones sound pretty interesting too. And the, um, I think when he originally wrote the piece, he was trying to get all the aspects of land, fire, and water in the mix. And you're supposed to, I think when he did it, there was, there's these little, uh, trays that you put sand in, or you're supposed to put sand in, so that if any water falls out, it lands on the sand, and then the burning pine cones is fire, and then this is water, and the sea. It's really, really, really beautiful piece, and we always like to pair it up with something like their construction to kind of show two of his many, of his multifaceted For sides. For percussionists, or just, I guess, any musician, just any sound-making folk, uh, there's so many pieces that he wrote. I, I think it'd be it'd be really neat. I know for us, like like Josh said, pairing something that's highly structured and rhythmic, like their construction, with a later one of his pieces that's um, a little bit more I don't know maybe experimental or, or sound based um, is, is a really nice balance for us. And and I think it could be really wonderful if you're learning their construction to take a piece like like in Lids, Child of Tree Branches, a beautiful piece called uh, What About the Sound of Crumpling Paper. Um, pieces that are, are um, you'll learn a lot about where John Cage is coming from and learn a lot about um, how you feel about sound making, um, but also that are, are maybe less uh, rigid and less notes to learn. But to, to learn them side by side, um, I think for us has been really rewarding and, and could be for you guys too. 